How was the first day? Awesome. <laughs> no, very good. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I basically, Susanna already introduced that. So we see a lot of movement towards the cloud. I, um, I also see that. I, I have a lot of anecdotes nowadays where people say that to me. I had it yesterday, I think, three times. Uh, we moved even from a cloud-ready strategy that was like last year to a cloud-first strategy now. So we want to go to the cloud first and not only be ready for that. And I even heard that this year, and that surprised me a bit at least, from a big retailer in Germany headquartered. They do over 100 billion turnover every year, so it's quite huge. But Germany headquartered, and they also had that. We go with cloud first. And that's quite interesting, actually. And um, as I'm kind of a, still that's a very abstract thing, right? And you could argue like, okay, that's that next buzzword going around and cloud and microservices. And, and it's probably climbing up the curve, but it will fall down the curve again, right? The hype cycle. So that will happen. And I had a very personal aha moment where, where I really believed in this kind of technology. And since then, I really believe in serverless, to be honest. And um, you probably know that there's this cloud scale workflow thingy going around. You've, probably heard of that called CB, right? Or CBO or C, how do you pronounce it? It's CB. And when we did that, and I'm, this is what I, what I normally do, when I get that, that kind of technology and we promise the world, hey, that's horizontally scalable, that's cloud scale, I want to see that. I want to do it with my own hands, with code, and I want to really see it in action. So that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to do a benchmark. I want to put it in the cloud because I wanted to scale it up to hundreds of cluster nodes, basically. And I was not in the mood of ordering hundreds of servers and pile it under my desk. So I wanted to move it to the cloud. Easy exercise, right? Um, so that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to have um, CB there, and I wanted to have some load generator in order to really push loads on that platform. Relatively easy to do, right? I want to put it on the cloud. So what I, what I do, basically, Susanna walked you through all of that. So. Um, I need a container. So I used a Docker container, obviously, in order to create a Docker container. And when I did that, there was not a pre-packaged Docker container as it's now for C. Now for you, it's easier to just get it. But I had to build that. OK, Docker container. I have to decide for a JVM, a Java version. I don't care, actually, but I had to decide for that. I have to decide for a Linux version. That's even worse, right? I don't care about that as well. Um, it's not too hard. There are a lot of templates for that. But if you run it in production, you have to maintain that. You have to care about that. So that's quite already some effort. And then it doesn't end. Like, I want to put it on Kubernetes. And um, Kubernetes, then you have to decide for a platform. I wanted to put it on Google Cloud. And in order to do that, I had to write a couple of things, actually, were a couple of Docker files, a couple of Kubernetes configurations, a couple of things you have to do in Shell, which is my personal best friend, actually. So um, there are a lot of things you have to do. It, it, it was a good opportunity to learn Kubernetes. And it, it actually, it brought me the Linux subsystem on my Windows machine, because I needed that for something. So there were a lot of things which were quite enjoyable, but a lot of detours, actually. A lot of detours I had to do. And that um, didn't stop there. Then I had the load generator. Oh, OK, that also has to go to the cloud. So I need a JVM, I need a Docker container, which has a Linux and a Kubernetes, and so on and so forth. You get the idea. And that's. Um, what's referred to as that undifferentiated heavy lifting. Susanna also talked about that. And that's actually important to think about that probably twice. I personally love going hiking. I don't have a lot of time for that at the moment, but I love doing that. That's a picture from a hike for a couple of years back. And when I do that, it's, I had that situation very often, and that's my secret, um, let's say, uh, secret um, startup idea, which I tell you today. So. Um, when, when you go for that hike and you're finished with that hike, and it's like you enjoy the view and you said, oh, that was a beautiful day. And then I normally in the mood of, oh, no, I want to have a cold beer or a cold cocktail. But it's, I mean, you're in the hills. That's why you go there. And so I thought, but you have network coverage now all everywhere. So I want, I want to have that app where I go there and say, hey, I want to have that cocktail. Put it on a throne and deliver it to me now. That's my secret. Uh, if you do that, I'm happy if you steal the idea. I want to have the product. Not, I, I don't want to do the company. But um, that's what I wanted to have. And the thing is, if you build something like that, you can take that picture and you just build two different applications. The rest is the same. That's the undifferentiated heavy lifting, right? It doesn't differentiate at all. You can build a throne delivery or a workflow engine, arguably very different things. And the way I like to think about that, actually, um, is there was a blog post which really resonated with me. And they talked about cognitive load. And cognitive load means um, if you have a team 
uh, in this case, it was just me doing things, but normally you have a team, and that can do a certain amount of work. That's what you can do. And if you have these things like that Docker and Kubernetes and whatever it is, a lot of things you have to configure, um, that basically, yeah, then you put your effort into that. And you cannot put that effort, like that undifferentiated heavy lifting, basically takes off effort of that box what you can do. And then not much is left to do real work. That's what you want to do. And that's actually the situation for a lot of projects out there. I think a lot of projects are exactly in that situation. And that's a pretty bad place to be. Um, what you want to do is you want to move to, to the right and say, hey, I want, to I want to really reduce the undifferentiated heavy, heavy lifting in order to do real work. It's a cultural big change, actually. Uh, so, so I think it's not totally easy to do that. But um, it really pays off. And the most like, developers I talk to would be even happy to be on the right-hand side. I mean, what I said, I enjoy doing playing around with Kubernetes, but I, I don't have to do that every day, to be honest. So I, I can totally live without that. Um, so you want to move to the right. And that's the idea. So um, what I would love to have to do is something like, hey, I have uh, uh, come on a cloud. It's not there, but I would have loved to have that back then. And probably do the load generating as kind of a function as a service, for example. Then I don't have to care about that whole stack. That would be awesome. And that really, that was my personal story where I thought, OK, this is, um, this is not a hype. It's something that's here to stay. I, I, pretty, I really believe that by now, that the cloud is here to stay. We will really offload a lot of work towards the cloud. We will um, see much more serverless. We see more microservices. I'm pretty convinced that this will happen. It's not a hype that will go away. So we have to adjust ourselves, our practices, our best practices in order to, to cope with that new situation, right? And if you don't like the microservices, and that's what I sometimes hear nowadays for techies, like, yeah, microservices everywhere, um, they will be on the decline. And that might be true for the buzzword. We see that all the time, buzzwords come and go, but not for the basic idea. And the basic idea, if I, um, if I visualize it differently, is basically you have a couple of components, and they provide an API, and then you can integrate them. And these components might be very different things, might be microservices, might be solar services, might be Existing standard software might be um, services you leverage in the internet, just hosted services, might be functions if you go serverless. So there are a lot of these kind of components, but the, the common thing is they provide an API so I can integrate them with each other. And that's the situation we are in. And now the, the big challenge from my perspective is like, how do I, and uh, yeah, a couple of these things obviously will move to the cloud because then I can like, reduce that undifferentiated heavy lifting. Some things will be always be on-prem. That's my guess. But the most things will move to the cloud. And the challenge now is to connect these kind of services, how to connect the dots between them. And that's what I'm currently thinking about most, actually, and what I'm discussing most. How do I connect all these components in order to get something useful out of it? Because normally, they have to communicate. And I make an example today. And I like using examples everybody knows. So you probably booked a train ticket or an airline ticket. It's the same thing in the past. If you do that in Germany, you go to Deutsche Bahn, and you see that page. Basically, you click through a couple of things, select the connection you want to have, select probably the seat you want to reserve, um, the tariff and whatever. And at the very end, you, get your you enter your booking date details, and click on proceed. Then something happens. You're basically having that waiting thing, and then you get the ticket. Right? That's the experience you have there. Um, in the background, um, normally a couple of services are required in order to do that. For example, we have a booking service, and probably that uses something for the reservation, for the payment, and for actually generating that PDF ticket. Right? That could be like the situation. Um, the thing is, um, which is pretty interesting if you look at that, it always puzzles me, but it's still like that. So if you go from check and book, click on the proceed button, then it's a synchronous behavior on the UI. You really see the loading wheel for quite a bit until everything is done, and then the PDF directly opens up in your browser. The thinking behind that is, yeah, because the customer immediately wants to print it out, which was probably true a couple of years back. It's not true anymore, I think. I mean, probably my father prints it out, but I, that's the only person I know who prints out tickets at the moment. Um, so this is not even what I, what I want to have, but it has a lot of implications, actually. That's the design they wanted to have, right? And I discuss that regularly with different customers. They want that design for several reasons. But the thing is, um, if something goes wrong in that whole thing, 
whatever that is, the credit card is not valid, it's whatever, you can't connect to the credit card service, you can't create the PDF, there are a lot of things that can go wrong. Um, what you get is a synchronous error message. Right? Hey, it didn't work. Hmm, that's a pretty bad user, behavior, uh, user experience, right? And it's not only about the user experience, if you look further, it has a couple of technical weaknesses you should, should think about. Um, the first is very obvious. It's um, uh, sometimes referred to as latency creep. I know I, I, I like that term. Um, so let's assume you have latencies to the other services when you call them by REST. It takes 300 milliseconds, 600 milliseconds, whatever. And you have to, or you want to call them in, in a sequence. Then latencies add up. This is why you see that wheel loading for so long. And it um, actually limits you in what you can do. You can't just exchange every service. If the latency is too high, you can't do it because the person would wait too long for its ticket and think, hey, this is not going to work. I close the browser or whatever. So it really limits you. And it, again, is a bad user experience. Um, next thing is, and that's my favorite, actually, um, availability erosion. So if you do a good work and you probably get up to 99% uptime for most of the services, which is harder than it sounds, actually. I, I know most of the services are not at 99%. Um, but even if you do that, I mean, it doesn't work like the seat reservation service says, hey, I know there will be a lot of people going, um, booking a ticket tomorrow at 5 p.m., so I crash at 5.10. And then the payment service says, that's a good idea. I joined that. I crash at exactly the same time. This is now how it works, right? They crash at different times, and that means the availability goes down. And if you have more than three services, you're, you're, it's, it's quick that you end up with whatever 90% availability, even if you try hard for all the single services. It's hard to avoid. And then the, the, the most tricky thing is like it's even hard to implement. I mean, and that's, that's, that's actually the hilarious part about that. So we built all that hipster architecture thing about event-driven architecture, message buses, whatever. Really cool things, right? Technically, that's awesome what we can do with that. And then we create a facade in order to make that synchronous again, which is really hard to do in order to provide a really flawed user experience. That's weird, and people do that all the time. And this is just one example. I have hundreds of these examples, and I discuss that all the time. The good news, part of, is I know a couple of tools which can make that easier, which can do a couple of things for you. So um, it's probably not necessarily my personal problem. I can live with that. Um, but I think as an industry, we should do better. We should definitely do better. Um, and that normally means you also have to think about the workflow, the business process. You have to redesign them. It's just like because it was like that in the non-digitalization age or in five years ago doesn't mean it's the best user experience. So at least you should do something like, hey, if everything is fine in the rare case that you don't have errors in your system, you produce a ticket. But if not, you send it, I mean, you send an email with the ticket. Where's the problem? You send it later on. Um, in the better case, you should probably completely redesign it. I mean, who wants a ticket as a paper PDF thingy? I want to have it in the app, and I just need it when I enter the train, not before. So you have plenty of time. You can do that completely different. And that opens up so many possibilities. And I started to refer to that in discussions as what I call reactive business processes. Like, you should, if you have this fancy architecture which supports being reactive on the technical side, you have to think about business processes to support that, to adjust to it, to leverage the power you have in your technical architecture. And that's important. If you don't do that, it not only clashes in all of the discussions with the, with the business, um, but it's even harder to implement. And it's still a bad user experience. Um, if you wonder all the time what's reactive, what's reactive is all about, I'm, um, referring to reactive as defined in that reactive manifesto, and there's also currently forming a, a working group in the CNCF about reactive. So that quite starts to be a thing. Um, and it basically describes three characteristics of a service or an application or a system as a whole. It should be elastic, so I can scale it up and down depending on the demand. It should be responsive. Um, that means it should produce a response all the time, but also probably in a, in a quick enough, right? Um, and resilient, so some failures of certain components doesn't lead to a whole downtime of the whole system, right? Um, and that's where I'm not really totally d'accord with the picture. Um, it's implemented by being message-driven. In a way, that's correct, but that's for me not the important part. So, and that's a reactive system. So um, that's what we should do, right? 
Awesome. Let's go react it. Um, that was a talk from the QCon New York. That's Phil Calando. He um, for, works for Meetup, or worked for Meetup at that time, and he described his um, yeah, experience with this kind of event-driven architecture. And I, I, I personally like the name, Pinball Architecture. I made a picture that you can imagine what, what this is about. So if you have these services, and if you have a request, that's the small ball over there. And I'll wait for it. That's an awesome animation. It took me quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> you send in the request, and you get the pinball architecture. You want to see it again, right? Yeah. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> we do it again. <laughs> I can do that for ages. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy that you like it, too. Uh, we do it one last time. I don't have too much time for that. Uh, <laughs> So that's a pinball architecture. You can recognize that by the um, number of times people ask what the hell just happened. It's, it's, <laughs> it's kind of what you remember from movies, like we implement that in PLSQL, you just database triggers, right? So it's kind of probably not the best place to be. I, um, but more seriously, I, um, I discuss that regularly at the moment. And th that was an um, article I wrote after I had a longer conversation um, with actually a very big client in the US about um, account opening or customer onboarding, a very generic use case. Basically, everybody has that. They had it on a very big scale. And they said, no, we want to go with, um, in this case, Kafka, and we want to do it event-driven. So that means they have this kind of ping pong going on between a couple of services, like credit check and address check, and so on and so forth. How it looked was more or less a bit simplified like that. We had a registration, so customers come in. That produces an event on the bus. Hey, we want to have somebody registered. It goes to the credit service. It does its checks. Um, that emits a new event, says, hey, there was credit check was successful or whatever, credit checked. Um, so it address check knows, oh, then it's my turn to check the address. It emits an event. Customer knows as soon as the address is checked, I'm done and the customer is registered. That's what I call an event chain. Right? So we need that chain in order to, to happen. And there are a couple of problems with this architecture, but let's focus on the first and most obvious one, it's hard to understand that workflow which is going on. If you look at the system, not on that slide, but in the real world, you normally go to one team, like the credit check, and you, you're basically in that box looking out, and you just see I'm waiting for a registration requested, and I'm emitting credit checked. I have no idea what happens around me. So there's, in that whole picture, there's nobody caring about that end-to-end -end workflow. Right? Um, there is some help probably for understanding it. That's, for example, why we are um, investing in that process event monitoring thing. Daniel had that yesterday in his keynote where he, where he showed the prototype we did with Optimize. I'm really excited about that because we see that problem so often that you have these event-driven architectures and you have all these events on the bus and now you can at least like pull them into um, Optimize and have that, what Daniel called, that synthesized process for that and map it to it. So you get some visibility. You, you, under, you can probably understand the workflow or check if your understanding of the workflow is what the reality really is in the system. That's the first step. For me, that's the first step. It's an important one, actually. And I'm, what I said, I'm quite excited about that. But it's the first step. You still, you're now probably able to see that pile of things there. Um, but as soon as you want to change something, it's still hard. It's like, it's a bit like, if you, if you imagine that in Mikado, it's like, yeah, we can keep it like that. It's perfect. We just need that one stick down there. Just that one stick and put it to the top. How hard can that be? <laughs> and you all know that. It's very hard. It's very hard. I may just make an example, and there was kind of the example we really discussed, so it's not an artificial one. Let's add another check, something like a criminal registered check or whatever. Um, in order to implement that, what we have to do is we have to remove the connection between customer and address here, right? Um, we have to deploy criminal check and say, OK, you're now listening to address check. And the next thing we do is we have to change the customer service in order to listen to the criminal checked event. Okay. There are, I'm not going into too much detail here. In the article, I go to, through different possible event flows, which might be easier to tackle. Um, but the thing is, whenever you change something in the sequence of things, 
It's hard. It's simply hard, and you have to touch a couple of components which you might not even know that they exist. And that's hard. That's really hard. Um, it always reminds me of this. Like, this is the picture you normally see in talks which advocate this choreographed approach. Which, uh, so the name is choreography for this kind of purely event-driven thing. And it's, a, it's that dance, right? So every of the microservices is one of these dancers. Um, and now you know the license of it. That's good. Um, and every microservice is one of these dancers, and they are professionals, right? They know how to behave, so you can just add another dancer, and he knows the choreography, so he just joins the dance. That's beautiful, right? Isn't it? It's not what I see in reality. It's, <laughs> it's kind of hard to, to manage. It's hard to understand what's really going on. It's hard to change things. So it's, it's, I think it's not the place you want to end up doing it. And the, the important first step is to see the difference. And what's the difference? You could use orchestration. That's the choreography on the one hand, orchestration on the other hand. And you could say, hey, the registration probably still emits an event. I have no problems with that part of the story. So that probably still makes sense. I'm not saying you should remove event driven from your architecture. But um, the next thing that could happen, customer or some other service, whatever, some service which is really responsible for doing that listens to that event. And then the next thing is you're not, in this case, not event driven, but you send out a command. You, you, you're calling that other service. You send out a message with a command. Say, hey, now is the time to do the credit check. And credit check doesn't have to know why. It doesn't care. It just knows, oh, it's my turn. Whenever I'm done, I produce an event. And then customer knows, oh, if the credit is checked, the next thing is address check. Right? and so on and so forth. And now you have that one single point where you can understand and even change the flow. Right? Um, and probably you even want to use some kind of workflow to implement that. Makes always sense, I guess. Um, but uh, it's not necessarily that you have to have a workflow. And also important to point out on the picture, it's not that I, that I draw some whatever central workflow engine number there. It's really it's part of that customer work, customer service, customer whatever. If you're in DDD, it's probably some kind of context you're there. It's part of that. It's part of that business logic. But it's orchestration. And then it's easy to make that change, right? You just add the criminal check. And I say, OK, um, I have to send it a command, wait for the response, and probably just adjust the workflow. Because I can say, OK, I know exactly here here, here is where I want it to have, right? And then you deploy it. It's also easier in terms of versioning because I normally still have circulating things in my system, OK? So there are a lot of advantages for, for, for doing that. But the, um, the, th <laughs> the thing is that there, there, there are a lot of myths around coupling. And it took me a while to really discover that I'm now really convinced they're totally myths. They're, misunderstandings, so probably sometimes even lies, I don't know. Um, but they're, they're, if two components in your system communicate, they're always coupled, always, in a way. You might see it, or you, might don't, or you probably don't see it, but they're still coupled. There's no way around that. And if you look at that scenario, like the different alternatives, like choreographed and orchestrated, very often people say, yeah, but I want to use that event-driven approach because it's so decoupled. Why is that more decoupled? I, that's just not true. If you look at it, if you want to make a change, and that's how coupling is, at least in an architectural sense, important. How easy can I make changes? If I want to make that change of the criminal check, in the upper left corner, I have to do two. Redeploy the criminal check, change the customer service. In the upper right corner, I have to deploy the criminal check, adjust the customer service. The same thing. I have to do the same changes. It's not more coupled. It's just not true. Um, I go into much more details in that article, right? So um, what I think, and that's an important thought you should have, um, if you do your IT architecture, and you probably have a lot of these services, like I made them balls by, the, uh, by uh, intention, like, so it's kind of an instable thing, right? Um, they're all sitting there doing things, and then you have these two pillars, which basically hold that whole thing, and both are important, choreography and orchestration. And whenever it's not really balanced, so if you do too much or too little of orchestration, basically, you might end up in the chaos bucket. Right? So all these, like you see, the, some of these balls are probably tripping down. Um, this visualization thing, the event monitoring, might, might help you stop that or slow it down. 
So I think it's a good, good thing to have it, but it's not really um, removing the problem here. And what I see is people are doing that. Why? Because in the past, they did too much orchestration, and then basically a lot of things fall in the monolith bucket. And that's what they wanted to avoid. So they cut that, and now they go the other direction. And the pertinent thought is you have to balance both. That's the challenge. You have to balance choreography and orchestration. Sometimes an event driven, um, basically coupling is a very good one. Sometimes it's a really bad decision. And it depends on the communication, between, on that single communication between two components. There's not the rule you do it that way or that way. You have to decide on a case by case basis, which is normally that's the it depends, right? So that's the hard part. I'm sorry, but I, so far what I saw, that's the way um, you should approach that. So a quick recap, let's, so let's say we, 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 we buy that. We have these different components, we have the different services and functions, and we have to connect them. In order to, do the, to leverage that environment, we have to adjust our business processes to also be reactive, to change in a way to really leverage that infrastructure. That's an important next thought. And in order to be successful with that, technically, you have to balance choreography and orchestration, right? So that's kind of the, in a nutshell, what I tried to get across in the last 20 minutes or 25. Um, so that's easy, right? Let's do that. The, um, who of you remembers Nintendo? Nintendo, yes, I guess that, right. Um, it's, it's kind of the similar question, like who is developer? It's kind of like normally the same people. Um, so in Nintendo, and I was the first one, NES, that's what I played like a long time. Um, basically, and I, I, I don't know, that's probably a killer feature. They should reintroduce that. But NES was not capable of saving the current state of the game. <laughs> that was quite a killer feature for playing it all night. If you switch it off, it's gone. You have to restart it. And if you don't switch it off, that's what I did. Normally, your parents sooner or later cut the cable and then it switched off. So you have to keep playing. And in Nintendo, there's the, um, the end boss. You remember the end boss, like the final enemy at the end. So whenever you know where you want to go, but there's a final enemy. And in that game, what I saw at a lot of customers by now, the final enemy um, is what Jakob introduced that last year, and I love it. It's the TLM. Uh, the TLM is the terrible legacy monolith. He defined it very clearly, very precisely last year. So what's the features? The features are it has a very clumsy user interface, because it was probably built 20 years ago probably 30. It has no proper API, right? Um, it's one big pile of code. Nobody understands. The last people understanding it quit it 10 years ago or five years ago. You can release probably a tiny feature once a year, if you're lucky, and so on and so forth, right? So um, that's very often the situation you have. And that one, it just sits in front of that nice idea. You want to have that in the like in the back, how can we get there? And so far, there are a couple of different strategies. And I don't have the time to cover them all. But the, um, what I saw at a couple of customers working best so far, or the only thing I really saw working, is that they basically need two things. The first is um, you have to have an API for that thing. It doesn't provide it. Then you have to get it somehow. That's why a lot of effort is put into whatever, having Java services in front of your mainframe. That's what the whole RPA thing is about. That's the one use case where you should use RPA. The, the single one, that's the only one. But there, it's really useful. Um, so you have to have that API in order to integrate it in the other like, um, things. And then, whenever you want to change something in the monolith, in, instead of, I mean, you normally can't just do a big project, cut it into pieces, and distribute it. That just normally is too risky, too expensive, doesn't work. So what you do is, whenever you have some kind of pain, uh, you want to change something, you have a feature request, you, you take that opportunity, cut something out of the monolith, and move it into whatever a microservice, for example. And this is more painful than it looks like, because the cutting out is very often very hard. Um, but that's the way. And then step by step, you're basically removing a lot of things from the monolith and cutting a lot of connections in the monolith and getting to, to that new world. I think that's what you probably should aim for. Um, I call that PDD. That's the last thing you can learn here today. PDD, who knows what PDD stands for? Oh, great, I, I have my own acronym, that's good. Um, it's pain-driven development. Um, <laughs> with that, um, I'm leaving you, um, that's basically 
all I, yeah, I, they take you pictures. I, uh, to, to, to coin, that's my term. Um, with that, I'm leaving you. Thank you very much. That's all I have. I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. <laughs>